Great. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. Thanks so much for being here. We're very excited to have Dr. Max LeBoron <laughs> with us this evening. Max is an, is an assistant professor of sociology and environmental sciences at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Before arriving at her current post, she held postdoctoral fellowships with the Social Science Environmental Health Research Institute in Northeastern and with Intel's Science and Technology Center for Social Computing. Max completed her PhD in the Interdisciplinary Media Culture and Communication Program at New York University. During her time at NYU, Max was one of the co-founders, really, of our field of study here uh, this spring, Waste Studies. Uh, Max began to collaborate with Dr. Robin Nagel, who some of you saw um, a couple weeks ago here as part of the Sagan series. That collaboration with Robin led to Max's ongoing work as the primary author and editor on the Highly Visible Discard Studies blog. Incidentally, actually, the Discard Studies blog uh, pointed the way for our initial explorations of waste as we planned this year's Sagan series. So um, Jim, John, and myself really wouldn't have been doing the work that we're doing this spring if not for Max's pathbreaking work. Max's academic work focuses on how waste and wasting and collateral phenomena like slow disasters and toxicants become perceptible through science and activism. But Max not only studies these processes at the intersection of materiality and representation, she's also a practitioner. Max consistently intervenes in what I would call the becoming perceptible of waste and wasting through science, art, and activism. Some of this interventionary work runs through um, various community-based projects that she's doing, including uh, the Civic Laboratory for Environmental Action and Research, or CLEAR, for which Max is the founder and director. This activist science work, and I think she'll talk about some of that tonight, um, is novel not only for its findings, but also for its methodological challenge to the exclusions upon which many of our claims to scientific authority still frequently uh, are made. Tonight, Max will present scientific cultures and controversies over matter out of place, so please join me in welcoming Max as our third speaker for this year's SNC. All right, can you hear me? Am I hooked in? Yes, excellent. Thank you for nodding. Otherwise, we'd be here longer. All right. All right, so thanks very much for that introduction. You're totally hired to do all my introductions from now on. That was succinct and flattering both. So, excellent. Uh, so I'm particularly excited to be here during this series on waste um, because, uh, well, waste and culture, because I come, from, I come to discard studies and waste studies from a science and technology studies perspective, which means I do the social study of science and technology. I also make science and build technology, but I also study the social processes of that. So I'm really interested in your questions and your insights um, and some of the thoughts that you guys have been having from the other speakers and how we can apply some of those insights and questions to science. Um, because they hold. I'm going to make the argument that uh, science is inherently cultural. It is a culture. Um, and so they should hold across these different cultures, whether you're talking about Asia or science or Ohio. So the three cultures. <laughs> All right. So while I publish academic papers and do professory things, almost everyone knows me as a blogger uh, for the Discard Studies blog. Uh, discard Studies is a term that Robin Nagel coined in 2010, who you guys saw a couple weeks ago. And she chose discard studies instead of waste studies or trash studies because the, one of our main priorities is to defamiliarize trash and waste. Right? So most of us deal with waste or trash every day. In fact, I'd be challenged if you didn't. Uh, right? We deal with it, we bin it, we sort it, we make it, uh, we take it out, it goes away. But the thing is that, so most of it looks for us, oh, I need to turn this on maybe, maybe not. Just kidding, we're going to use these. Most of, our, most of what we know looks like this, municipal solid waste. But the problem is that of municipal solid waste, only about a third of that is household waste. Another third is uh, institutional or commercial waste, and another third of that is uh, C&D waste, construction and demolition waste. So actually we're only dealing with about a third of municipal solid waste. But also municipal, municipal solid waste is only a third, again, no, 3%, just kidding, that's not a third, 3% of all the waste produced in North America, 97% of waste produced in North America is industrial solid waste. It looks like this. A lot of it comes from mining, uh, agriculture, other things like this. And that starts to look a lot like pollution. So waste and pollution aren't actually very different things, right? Because this is solid waste produced by industry. And also, the things that we call municipal solid waste or that we deal with, things like packaging and cardboards and the old shoes you threw out, those came from industrial processes that produced waste. So it's sort of an extension 
of industrial solid waste. So already, something like garbage has already been expanded to something like pollution. But we also then deal with things like ruins, ruinations, right? Ruined landscapes, disposed of landscapes, sacrifice zones, if you've heard that term, disposable people, right? And so what we try and do in discard studies is not just look at waste, but look at all of the things that have been externalized from other systems. So really what we look at is what I would call externalizations, things that have been pushed out of the center that are what keep the center being the center. And the other thing about discard studies is we're not just studying garbage. It's not a content-based um, area, although we do study waste pollution externalities. So when an engineer studies waste, it's very different than discard studies. Discard studies is about, uh, it's a critical study. It comes out of the social sciences and humanities. We question premises, we question assumptions, and we look at these systems and what's, what holds them together. And these systems are very much at, at the, at the core of, of what we do and also one of our foundational texts, which is Mary Douglas's Purity and Danger, which is not actually about garbage at all. Uh, it's about taboos, it's an anthropological text about um, how ooh happens, how gross happens, essentially, how things you're not allowed to do. And her idea is that where there's dirt, which is what she calls pollution or ooh, um, there's a system. And so one of the premises of discard studies is you can always study a system by what it externalizes. So you can do an entire systemic, cultural, anthropological study just based on waste and how things are wasted, how and why and, and under what conditions. Uh, and this is where matter out of place comes in. And culture is very central to this is because what makes something in or out of place is whether it is within classifications or is exceeding those classifications. Mary Douglas actually says that waste is not matter out of place because it clearly belongs in a bin, a blue bin or a black bin. So actually, and our entire waste infrastructure is designed to keep waste in place. And if it's out of place, right? I know where to put that. You know where to put that. No problem. This is an ooh, right? So one of the big questions that I research is, OK, you have something, a piece of waste, a piece of pollution, an emerging form of harm that is something like this, say. And it's in place through all these infrastructures. How would you make it out of place? if people already recognize it as something that they're familiar with? How would you actually move waste to something that is out of place? How would you make it um, contradict chairs classifications when it's already been heavily classified? So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about sort of one of the ways um, to come at discard studies through science studies, the cultural role of science, um, how sci the role that science plays in discard studies and in waste generally. And then I'm gonna look at that through um, my main case study, which is plastic pollution with an emphasis on marine plastics. So, there's an idea that there are two main approaches to studying garbage or waste or pollution or externalities. One is the discard studies way, where we study cultures and systems and what people do and why they do it, what their motivations are, right? And then there's science, and science counts things that have already been classified as waste. We don't really deal with that, right? My work happens exactly in the intersection and makes the argument that science, both within science as a culture that determines, you know, there are politics or their classifications, there are my classifications, um, and then also that outside of science, they have to make meaning circulate in the wider public. So in all of my classes, we differentiate between the social and the cultural. Step number one, when I work with engineers especially, the social is about relations between people, people and people, people and groups, groups and groups, groups and institutions, institutions in the state, you know, all of this, that's social. And then there's culture. And culture includes things like um, rituals and values and beliefs. But all of those things together make certain meanings. So when I say hijab, you all know what I'm talking about. When I say uh, square pants SpongeBob, Bob Square, you all know what I just did wrong. I don't, it'll catch me in a second. Right? But we know what we're talking about. Even if you have different opinions as to whether that's good TV or good practice or whatever, we all know what we're talking about. We make sense. So culture is also about the things that can and cannot make sense, can and cannot be valid, the meanings that circulate amongst groups of people, that circulate more or less easily, right? And so when I look at um, scientific cultures, and now you have to believe me that science is a culture because there's a, there's a journal called Science is Culture. <laughs> I can end my argument here. Uh, but these group of people, this heavily posed lab group, Right? If, if they're having a conversation where certain things can and cannot make sense, you know, some of the things are more or less valid. So if I, you all have pieces of paper and you go to throw, you, go, you, know, you don't want them and you go to throw them out and there's a blue bin and a black bin, you all are gonna put them in the blue bin. You don't have to have a conversation ahead of time. You all know what's going on. If there's a yellow bin, it doesn't, I don't know what's gonna happen there. 
right? Well, if scientists, if I give someone a pipette, they're going to be like, I'm going to go, but they, they know what it is. They can pipette or not, but they're not going to do something like put it in their nose or, right? There's, there's a sort of, you know, there's a practice that we don't have to discuss that they know how to do. And going through university is basically acculturating young people into science, right? You're learning the culture. You're learning what you do and do not put in a lab book. You're doing what, what is and is not allowed to make sense. So the thing about science and moving from sci between science and culture and science as culture is that facts don't stand by themselves. So if I were to say, hey, guys, I've just discovered that tabletops, flat surfaces like tabletops, emit radiation. Now you know. Y'all aren't going to probably believe me. None of you just moved away from the table, so clearly you don't believe me. So there's, there's certain cultural work you have to do to get from facts to a meaning that circulates. Right? So if you think, and there's a guy named Thomas Kuhn, actually, if you know uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, this great book, where he says the way that you move through scientific paradigms is not based on the facts within those paradigms. So if you want to move, say, from uh, Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics, you just don't have better facts and therefore move to the better science. And that's never been the case. Um, so one of, these, one of my favorite moments in history is the move from miasma theory to germ theory. So miasma theory is the longest running scientific theory of disease. And when I say scientific, I mean not from gods, right? It's actually like based in material world. So this idea that bad smells cause people to be sick. So uh, swamps and standing water and rocks you break open to get ores and sewage. When it emits bad gas, that gas gets in you, it upsets your humors and that makes you sick. And so the way you deal with it is you drain swamps and you cover barrels of water and you ventilate industrial and household areas and people don't get sick as much. It works. And it worked for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It is the longest running scientific uh, theory of disease, more so than the germ theory. And so this is really working really well. And then these people come around. These old guys are like, actually, the way that disease happens are these little things that aren't really animals and aren't really plants that are very small and you can't see them get in you and make you sick. No, like that doesn't, no. that doesn't make any sense to me. That's silly, right? So you don't just get to say, this is a better fact. Believe it now. And we say, OK, let's go, right? Think, too, of like something like the creationists versus evolution, evolutionary theory. Right? Those folks, you can't win one over to the other by having better facts. When those folks are having a debate, they're actually not debating the same thing because they have fundamentally different ideas about what counts as evidence, what is true, what is valid, how you make something true, how cause and effect works, fundamentally ideas of what those things are. They will never come on side because you finally convince them with more facts. So in this case, in that case, in moving, whenever you go through scientific uh, controversies, you're always doing it on cultural grounds, not scientific grounds. You always do it through persuasion. You have the sexier facts, usually. Things fit better. They resonate better. More experts have right? something like this, some sort of persuasive thing, because the facts by themselves don't do it. So uh, there is a modern equivalent of this moment Right? where there are scientists who work in plastic pollution who are trying to argue that everyday things that we're surrounded by is a form of matter out of place, that, it for, that it's, it's harmful, but it's not quite circulating, it's not quite breaking ground, it's a, in controversy, and I'll talk about some of those now. So this is Newfoundland, this is where I live now. This is summer. <laughs> I'm going to give you a quick introduction to uh, marine plastics, plastic pollution, uh, how it works, and then I'll move through the controversies, and then some of the ways that artists and scientists are trying to resolve some of those controversy and make them less controversial and more facty through persuasion, through cultural, m m leveraging cultural meanings, basically. So there are plastics in every ocean in the world, including the Arctic. I live in water that comes down from the Arctic. There's plastic in that. This is in New York City, where um, I was doing some research last summer. So there's plastic there. And this is what the plastic that I got from the Hudson River in New York City looks like. 93% of all plastics, marine plastics, are smaller than a grain of rice. They're called microplastics. Uh, so if you've ever heard this island of floating plastics, it ain't no island. There is no island. This is what the island looks like. It's distributed, tiny, mixed up, and you cannot walk on it or do islandy things with it. Right? That was a media metaphor that has raged out of control. And now one of my biggest jobs and everyone else who lives, works in marine science is that we de-island marine plastics. So most are this size. 
Um, that little gray one right there, that's a microbead, if you know what microbeads are. Those are the things in cosmetics that wash down that y'all just passed a bill to not have anymore. Congratulations, that is amazing. Um, that is a Canadian nickel, roughly the same size as your nickel. I had that question before. <laughs> and this is even smaller. This is an order of magnitude smaller. Same, same samples. So plastics don't biodegrade, right? They fragment into smaller and smaller pieces to the, si to the size where they can be eaten by plankton. This is phytoplankton, bottom of the food web. We've actually found plastics circulating in the blood of mussels, right, the little clammy bits. So there's plastic, it ingested plastics through its little filter feeders, went into its gut, translocated from its gut into its blood, ran around its blood, through the liver and back out again. That's how small these plastics can be. Those are called nanoplastics. But why is that any kind of problem? It's not a problem, is it? Eat weird crap all the time, it's fine, right? So what is it that makes plastic the ocean's deadliest predator? How do we get from deadly and predator and dangerous from little tiny pieces of plastic? One of the main things that people talk about is when a plastic is that small, it's very bioavailable, which means many, 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 many things can eat it. Things from the size of a whale to things the size of a plankton are smaller. So a lot of things are eating it, but why is that a problem? I ate a piece of plastic last week, look at me. I'm amazing. This is easily the most famous photo in all of marine plastic. How many people have never seen this photo before? You all need to be on the internet more. <laughs> <laughs> this is a photograph by Chris Jordan. Chris Jordan is an artist. Uh, he works with scientists, so one of the main ways that we look at plastics is by doing necroscopies of birds like this, counting the plastics, because birds have very concrete way, where, areas that they fly in. Um, so you can do plastic counts this way. And this is a very legible image, right? This bird clearly died from eating plastic. There is a, um, hang on, I got a pointer, it's awesome. Yeah, that's uh, lighter. We've got a, um, some tweezers in there. We've got a bottle cap, we've got a comb. Oh my God, those are my, I've used all those things. Y'all killed this bird, right? Our garbage killed this bird. And this backs it up. If you don't pick it up, they will. If you don't pick up your garbage, the, you kill birds. Right, that's what, this, that's what that says, right? As it happens, none of those are facts. Not a single one of those things, I said, is, a, is based in empirical evidence whatsoever. First of all, birds eat all sorts of crazy things and they still live. So these are a bunch of plastics I pulled out of dove keys. Um, one of the main, I do biomonitoring of plastics. I dissect animals all the time and they were fine before I dissected them. <laughs> <laughs> So these guys were flying along and in Newfoundland, Newfoundland is one of the third windy cities in the, or places in the world, and they got blown into a cliff and they all died. This is what they were fine before that, right? It's called a wreck. This, these are what I pulled out of one bird's stomach. It was fine. This is what I've pulled out of a fulmar stomach. Fulmars are just like albatross, same sort of size. They eat the same sort of thing, slightly different area further north, right? You've got, these are plastics. That is not, not a plastic, 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 not a plastic, plastic, no, I don't know what that is. Um, that's a big rock, or a little rock. Seashell, rock, rock, I don't know what that is, right? I need to look at it closer. I do know what it is in my lab notes, but not right now. So birds like albatross, well, birds in general, but particularly birds like albatross, eat all sorts of things that are not food. So it's not just that they've mistaken something for plastic. They had a neurological moment and they just mistook something and they were tricked. They do not, they eat all sorts of things that have never been plastic and they always have. So it's not just that eating plastic makes you sick. The other thing is that albatross, fulmars and albatross eat squid. Squids have squid beaks. Squid beaks are incredibly hard and very, very sharp. I have cut myself on squid beaks. This is a squid beak wrapped in plastics. It was in a fulmar stomach and it got up into a little cavity and like made a little Christmas ornament. As it spun around, I did put this on my Christmas tree, in case you were wondering. I have a very depressing Christmas tree, <laughs> right? But you can have something as hard and as sharp as a squid beak in your belly and it does not necessarily puncture, right? So birds have incredibly robust bellies, especially birds like fulmar and albatross. Right? So just because they've eaten plastic also doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean they've choked. Sometimes that happens. It doesn't mean they've become full and can no longer eat more. Sometimes that happens, but generally not. Doesn't mean they've gotten been poked and oh my gosh, sometimes that happens, but generally not. So what's the problem with eating a plastic? So here's the thing about albatross. Albatross are some of the most successful seabirds right now, marine birds. 
They have, the, they have a population that's growing, very few other marine birds are doing this, and they have an expansion of range, which also uh, isn't happening very often. So they're incredibly successful. They're the most successful marine bird right now, except for on Midway Island, which is where that photo was taken. Why is that? Well, it's because the main predators of albatross on Midway Island, which is in Hawaii, are rats and cats, invasive species. And so the park rangers used to spend a lot of time protecting them from rats and cats and doing invasive species sort of removal things. But as soon as Chris Jordan's photo went out and the world went, oh my God, and started like really concentrating on plastic things, the rangers shift their attention from invasive species to plastics. And now for the first time, albatross populations are decreasing on Midway Island, Midway Atoll. So this is the danger of culture and charisma and having things that launch action very successfully. They can launch action in totally the wrong direction so that your solution and the problem no longer match up anymore and can actually do harm. Right? So just leveraging cultural meaning in a scientific-ish way, because Chris Jordan could only get onto Midway Atoll with islands. That, that bird that he took a photograph of is a scientific specimen. Right? They then count the plastics and it becomes a data point uh, in scientific studies. But yeah, this is one of the perils of going into this area uh, where you're leveraging culture and persuasion to talk about ecological problems or environmental problems. This is a problem that I think about a lot because I make these sorts of images. Right, you just saw a whole bunch of, this is my image, this is mine, it's my art at the moment. It's my craft, although I made it with Fulmar. Right? So, so I'm very, like, how can, I, how can we avoid that? How can we try and match action and culture and meaning onto also scientific facts so that they're accurate so that problems and solutions actually hit the same thing? instead of diverge. And also, what is the problem with plastics being in the ocean? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so plastics are hydrophobic, uh, but they absorb oily chemicals like crazy. Uh, plastic floating in the water can absorb up to a million times more chemicals than the surrounding water. So they aggregate and absorb and hang on to uh, oily chemicals. 80% of all marine plastics come from land, Right, so they escape infrastructure as a matter of course. Uh, so even if you put something in the bin, congratulations, you put it in the bin, but it might fly out at the, you know, at, out of the hopper, as uh, Robin would say, or at the transfer station, or on a loading dock, or whatever, and they get into the ocean. They're very light, they're very durable, and the ocean is downhill from everything. On the journey, they collect a bunch of pollutants. They also have pollutants that are already in them, right? So. BPA, already in there. Phthalates, already in there. So you've got plastics that are already in there and they're collecting more. And so they become poison pills, what we call poison pills, or nicknamed poison pills. So if you've ever had spaghetti or curry and you put it in Tupperware and you can't get the orange out, that's a manifestation of how plastics glom on and absorb oily chemicals. The way you would get that orange out is you'd put it in a hot, abrasive, acidic condition, like a stomach, and those things would migrate out again. So if you want to clean your Tupperware, you should eat it basically, or sunny conditions, um, but that doesn't happen in the stomach. And so when we, these are called nurdles. Nurdles are pre-production pellets. If you want to make something out of plastic, you order a gazillion of these things and they arrive in a big container and then you melt them down into your whatever. Um, about 20% of all marine plastics are these guys, right? So they've escaped infrastructure. And the way you can read them is these ones that are discolored, right? Most of them are white. Some of them are, uh, let's see if we can find one that's, no, most, oh, there's a black one. Some of them are colored, but almost never. Most manufacturers like to add their own color. But, so most of them are white, and the longer they're in, the more discolored they get. And these are chemicals that are accumulating, these dark colors, so that helps you age it. But also it shows you just the extent of what they've absorbed at that point. And when an animal eats them, right, all these chemicals move off and they bioaccumulate in the animal and they biomagnify up the food chain. Anyone here in chemistry? Yes, okay, great. Well, for the rest of you, uh, most of these, BPA, this is flame retardant. Uh, this is a plastic additive, Don't you can ignore that one. DDT is a pesticide. Almost all of these, except for the heavy metals, are what are called endocrine disruptors. You know what endocrine disruptors are? BPA is like the poster child of endocrine disruptors. They're chemicals that get into your body and act like a hormone. So most things like a poison, they'll get into your body and just break things. Endocrine disruptors get into your body and they party, they do things that would not normally happen under normal conditions, they act like a hormone, so they make things work in ways that they would not normally work. So they've been correlated with things like uh, early um, puberty in girls, specifically, early onset senility, early onset menopause, um, male infertility, they do something to little swimmy tails, make them funny and then they don't swim so well. 
that's a true story. Uh, the um, brain development, diabetes, obesity, eye problems, all of it, because your hormones do your whole system, right? Everything's going on. So, so that's what they're impacting. The problem is lots of other things are also impacting those things. I mean, obesity, there's a whole bunch of different causes of obesity, now including plastics um, and endocrine disruptors. So it's hard to tease those out. The other thing is, and this is now important for the controversy part, when you have hormones going on and you have raging hormones, they're not actually as bad as they could be. Because when you get to a certain level of hormone, your hypothalamus is like, that's enough, and it turns off the spigot. It either stops producing them and or it changes so that your receptors are a different shape and they can no longer accept more hormones. So you can't ever top out on hormones very effectively. Which means that the highest effects, the greatest effects of an endocrine disruptor or an endocrine or a hormone is at the lowest doses. Which is a really big problem. <laughs> which means tiny amounts make things happen. So this is a curve that is characteristic of the basis of toxicology. The danger is in the dose. We've been saying that since ancient Greek times. Anci uh, you know, ancient Greek times, yeah. The more you can absorb a little bit of lead, then some bad things start happening, and then you die, right? You sort of move up. Same with most, a lot of other chemicals. Not carcinogens, but a lot of other chemicals. But these are like, ooh, something's happening. OK, you get to a certain point, nothing more. So highest effects at lowest doses. There's a huge controversy in toxicology right now because everything, since the ancient Greek times, you, you do super high dose studies. And that's what everything, grants are based on that. Gold standards are based on that. All methodologies are based on high dose studies. Doing a low dose studies makes zero sense. It doesn't circulate, it's not valid, it doesn't, it's not allowed. It's just stupid science, stupid science. Can't do it, right? So imagine you give your mouse a teeny, teeny bit, tiny bit of BPA and it sneezes. Oh my God, the BPA made it sneeze. Nope, maybe it was cold. Maybe it's a sneezy mouse. Maybe the mouse has allergies, right? There's, you can't, but if you give it a whole bunch of BPA and then it sneezes till it dies, then you're like, yes, that is what happened. So giving things very low doses. <laughs> don't, don't ever do that to a mouse. Uh, <laughs> what a way to go. So, this, the, so the science of, of low dose effects is starting to come in, right? But it's not, it's hard to get grants for it. It's hard to make, super truthy statements about it, right? Especially in policy circles, because you can only kind of correlate, you can't make causal claims, right? All these sort of, all the sort of trappings of truth, this meanings that circulate, the culture of what is true and not true, valid and invalid, isn't working right now for endocrine disruptors, which is one of the main ways that plastics, whether they're in the ocean or on land, causes harm. We think, right? Because we're still working on this. So what do we do? Oh, oh, and this is, oh, by the way, this is what I want to show if you guys are into the quant. Milligrams, nanograms, to the negative ninth. Pretty big, right? So these are super tiny trace little, trace, trace, trace amounts that we're talking about. Stuff that is already present, by the way, in the human population. So how do we make this out of place, this super normal thing? How are, how are we as scientists and activists, and other, how are we going to make this out of place? How are we gonna talk that it's not okay, it's contravening cherished classifications, it's, it's bad, we gotta get it out of the system. How are we gonna do that? One of the ways, uh, this is the Environmental Working Group, which is an awesome NGO here. They're just trying to educate people about this curve. Look at all the things that happen at this different amount of this chemical. This is almost as sexy as that dead bird I showed you, right? No, this is not sexy, this is not persuasive, right? Okay, well, what else can we try? Consensus statements. This is where a whole bunch of leading, uh, these are all toxicologists and endocrinologists. Yeah, a mix of both of them. Get together and they agree together. They say we, on our pooled expertise, say that this is a true thing. This is a cultural move, right? This is about meaning and leveraging expertise to say something all together. All of you guys have already published many, many studies, individual studies, but they're not sticking. And so they come together and they make it. It's like a social movement, but of scientists. So that's one technique. And this is especially for the scientific community, also reporters and stuff, but this is an internal facing thing saying, this is the new normal, this is the new thing, this is the new classification. We would like this to be a fact. The other, then there's a whole bunch of other things that are going on. It is like a social movement, all sorts of different stuff. So we've got folks like Chelsea Rochman, total rock star, she's younger than I am, brand new scientist in the world, uh, writing in Nature magazine saying, we should classify plastic waste as hazardous. 
according to the Toxic Substance Control Act, there's a certain amount of uh, industrial harmful chemicals that equal hazardous waste, and when plastic absorbs chemicals, is that. So clearly, all plastics are potential hazardous waste and should be um, legislated as such. Imagine legislating plastic, plastic bags, packaging as hazardous waste. It would wipe out packaging. This, so this is a very radical statement coming from scientists published in Nature magazine. Um, we've got special issues coming out of biology, sort of like a consensus statement, but aggregated. Uh, we've got this sort of thing going on. So this is another, I think this is Environmental Working Group again. They're awesome. Saying, hey, these contaminants, these endocrine disruptors, they're in breast milk. Breast milk is a big frickin' deal. Like, yes, all adults have this stuff in them. Yeah, but babies are getting it. They're getting contaminated. Breast milk is sacred. It's a cherished classification. You cannot contaminate that stuff. Right, so trying to, again, leverage the sacred. Trying to like, so, so I do this too, a lot of scientists do, you try and test the charismatic areas. So I do more and more testing in the Arctic. The Arctic's supposed to be pure and natural and full of crap, guys. There's so much crap in the Arctic, right? But I can get published talking about the Arctic better than I can talk about like a river in Ohio. Obviously the rivers in Ohio are, you know, polluted. That doesn't get me, in, it doesn't give me radio interviews. The Arctic it does, it's more charismatic, right? There's more uh, cultural cachet. Uh, right, so going on TV, doing a bunch of this stuff. This and this, that's me, and this, this is citizen science. So one of the things that I do is I build tools that ordinary people who are not accredited scientists can build that are scientific instruments that can do scientific quality work yourself, scientific investigations. So you can go out and see if your local area has plastic pollution, marine plastics, because you can't actually see most marine plastics, right? They're smaller than a grain of rice. They're circulating in the blood of mussels. How are you gonna see them? with this, which you can build with a pair of pantyhose and a dryer vent, right? Or off the end of a boat. That's a piece of technology called baby legs because she's made of baby tights as a net. It's very cheap, she's very adorable. Um, right, uh, all sorts of different partnerships, right? So this is becoming a social movement where we're trying to amass a sort of consensus from a different bunch of different areas and a bunch of different techniques to try and align facts with culture to move the facts into a new sort of realm, into what is allowed and not allowed, into matter out of place. Uh, another technique that is extremely popular is talking about human health impacts. So you're actually, it turns out, not allowed to kill a human and dissect it and look at its digestive tract for plastics, you're right? Uh, but this is one of the most popular trends right now as far as you know, the cultural argument that this is impacting humans. It's in our food web. We actually haven't show, ha, done studies of plastics in humans, although we found it in human food webs, like salt and stuff like that. And so this is very popular. Right, if it's affecting us, that's sacred. That's a cherished boundary. Or you leverage humans in the place of animals to try and, you know, bring animal ethics into the human. This is not a scientific argument, right? But this is, I mean, Surfrider works with a lot of scientists. Surfrider has scientists working for them to create these sorts of things. And one of the, another argument is that just having plastics in the ocean is not okay. I don't actually have to demonstrate harm. It's just a contravention of cherished classifications and boundaries. That's just an anomaly that, that has to stop. It is wrong, right? Again, not a scientific argument, but it is one of the ones that come up the most when scientists talk on the radio or in public or on Letterman, which has happened, um, not to me. Or, right, or even in papers, even in scientific papers, people talk about that there just shouldn't be plastic there, and yes, these are my numbers, and we have to, but these numbers are whatever, uncertain, low, low resolution, whatever they might be saying, but we still have to do something about it because this is wrong. That probably comes up the most. Again, not a scientific argument, it's a cultural argument. And plastics aren't the only place where this is happening, right? There's lots of instances where you're trying to use charisma to make scientific arguments. So if you're a scientist, you know, this is not science. This is not a fact. This is a sample. It needs to be part of a larger body of work. You need to leverage it in certain ways. You need to talk about your sampling, et cetera. But this is one of the most circulated photographs, or this pair is one of the most circulated images of Flint because it's so easy to read. It makes that argument. Also leveraging the children argument out of Flint. Right? It's affecting children disproportionately. So again, trying to match on to things that are most sacred, most salient in a culture already so of trying to reinvent the wheel, you try and map it onto the wheel. Right, so trying to leverage things that are already important and sacred. And our goal is, 
right? So what I'm trying to do and what many other scientists are trying to do is move these two things together to make the argument again that culture and science are not separate. There are politics to measurement. There are you know, all these sorts of, there are struggles pertaining to power and what we choose to study, how we fund it, how we do study designs, how we disseminate knowledge, all this stuff. There is a political options and we're trying to make new cultural meaning and actions, right, that are usually considered outside of the scientific realm. Because in a perfect world, once we've done that, these can go back to being separate after it's totally normal that plastics aren't allowed in water and everyone knows that endocrine disruptors are bad and we shouldn't stop producing all this sort of stuff. So we can just go back to measuring stuff that's another stuff. Right, what's science? Most well, science just measures the amount of uranium or amount of radiation coming out of uranium tailings. I just want to, all I want to do is measure stuff and report on it. That will be the great luxury when I can once again say that science isn't cultural, which will never be true, but I could say that. And the only time I can say that is after we've already succeeded in making the cultural arguments. So thank you very much for your time. There's a man with a microphone over here. <laughs> Um, what do you think the implications or even the role that social media can play as a culture that is like increasingly dependent and like uses social media can play like as a cultural tool in like as science and dissemination of not this kind of knowledge? That's a great question. So it's a really, uh, it's a useful form of dissemination. The problem is it's extremely promiscuous. So, you know, like the Chris Jordan photograph, that thing circulates on Facebook like a house on fire and I just want to kill it every time I see it. Or Chris Jordan's uh, cleanup array. Have you seen that big thing that goes in the water? Or not Chris Jordan, Boylan Slat, the guy with the really good hair, the Dutch guy. Yeah, I hate his hair because it's, I think it's part of what gives him his appeal. Also, he's really young. But the cleanup array is stupid because it, first of all, doesn't address microplastics, right, at all. Um, it only addresses large plastics, which misses most of it. It kills plankton. So they're putting this huge thing in that spins plankton around and spits them out dead. Not a great idea. And it, it makes this idea that we've got this. We've done a technological fix for what is a systemic problem. And that is incredibly damaging because it's leveraging massive amounts of resources that way. And these are the things that are sexy and circulate on social media. I always see Boylan Slats clean up array on social media. Always, always, always. And I always link to my own and other people's peer reviews of it. Which are like, no, don't. Stop circulating it. Or, which never circulate as well as his for some reason on social media. Um, so the problem is that social media, and this is true of a lot of forms of representation, is they get split from their origins, they get split from fact checking, they get split from context very easily and can circulate what Aristotle would say promiscuously um, without the speaker there to provide context and stuff like that. So in one case, awesome. In another case, oh no. So I don't think it's ubiquitously good or bad. The problem is always how do you keep those things together? How do you keep the meaning and the context and the factishness and the responsibility and the ethics together in a representation so when they circulate, they don't escape the meaning that you intended for them? Or the wrong things don't circulate, the things that actually work against what people are saying. How do, how do, we, how do we do that? Like the you know this, this photo here? Oops. Sorry, I hate it when people do this in talks. Flashy, flashy. For some reason, this just didn't circulate on social media for some reason. <laughs> it's not so sexy, right? So part of it is like, how do we make these sorts of things, how do we make them in a format that disseminates in a, in a way on social media and other places that just grease the wheels of our message? It, because the wrong messages have their wheels greased really well. So that's an ongoing struggle that I deal with every day when I try and make images, scientific images. Let me know if you solve it. <laughs> Got one behind you. So you, I don't have much of a voice, sorry. Um, so you're saying that the aspects of the culture and science and talking about how plastic shouldn't be this norm, but have you looked into like the financial aspect of why plastic is a norm and say, it's really easy to come in and say to like people who have the opportunity, oh, buy glass Tupperware. And oh, I never, I would never say that. But, or like something in the sense of yeah. getting it out of the system, but how, how are you looking at it from a financial aspect? So the reason that plastics are so ubiquitous is because of oil. Oil is subsidized, it's a petroleum product. One of the strongest lobbies in the world is the American Chemistry Council, which represents both endocrine disrupting chemicals and the petroleum product industry. So extremely strong. 
right? Um, I've written papers called uh, Waste is a Economic Strategy. So there's a certain point where you need to make disposables because it moves financial responsibility out of industry and onto municipalities. Right? Municipalities pay for recycling, but if a, you have glass returns, industry has to foot that bill. Well, let's externalize that cost. Um, so, and people don't have a choice. I dare you to try and live without plastics. You can't, right? I'm not expecting consumers to change anything. I'm expecting citizens to change things because you have to be able to scale up to deal with oil. How do I deal with oil? I can't, but my politicians might, you know, this, so there are different ways that we try and scale up. One of the really good ways to scale up is science. Science circulates in a way that like me choosing between two things at the store doesn't scale. So it's definitely, and this is, this is why discard studies is really important and, and a sort of critical look at systems because it is very much an economic system. There are only two times in history that plastic production was not increasing exponentially. One was during the oil crisis in the 70s because there wasn't the feedstock and there was world uh, global slowdown of, of oil. And the second was during the recession that we just had. Those are economic, those are economic moments. Those are the only things that have ever succeeded in decreasing plastic production. So absolutely, right? And a lot of what I try and do in Five Gyres and my partners try and do is do things at policy and economic levels because that's, that's the scale that will actually address the problem. Yeah, that's, where the, that's the scale of the problem, yeah. So you can stop feeling guilty about not bringing your reasonable bake to the grocery store because it doesn't matter, guys. <laughs> it's not at a scale that's going to change anything. Like personal ethics, yes, that's important. But that moment where you don't do it, it's okay. Quantitatively, doesn't matter. Um, obviously, everything about this has a very political charge to it. I mean, you, you, it seems you're at the intersection of research and politics. Um, how do you deal with things such as anti-intellectualism, especially in this country? I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, I moved uh, to Canada. <laughs> that's one way to deal, I guess. But yeah. it's interesting for me because you can have a consensus statement on the state of the science, um, but people are like, oh, that's just a bunch of PhD mumbo jumbo. So how do you deal with that? And that's where charisma comes in, right? I show you a picture of a dead bird, if you're like, that did, oh, now you're a jerk, right? There's no, you can't do, <laughs> it's really hard to argue against Chris Jordan's photograph. I mean, I wish it wasn't that, but so what are, what are our equivalents as scientists that actually map onto cultural things that are not terribly refutable because they are cherished and, and, and important to people? The children, the mother's milk thing is, is, is a really key, uh, key area. Um, yeah, the other thing is I donate to the Union of Concerned Scientists. <laughs> Right, because that's the battle that they specifically fight is they find, is they support people who are the target of anti-intellectualism. Um, so the thing is, I used to, some of you guys know, I used to be a full-time artist. I have an MFA in studio art um, and background in science. And uh, I was making a lot of art that, you know, was supposed to be doing the sort of emotive, affective, argumentation sort of thing, but it didn't make the change that science makes. Because even in a country that's anti-intellectualism, and you guys, America is probably the worst for this right now, although, I mean, I haven't done a survey of the world. Um, but, so art can do it, except art doesn't circulate that way. Science actually circulates really, really well, especially if you can make it charismatic, especially if you have partners, especially, right, so um, something as simple as, um, so I just finished a, a study uh, where we looked at the plastic ingestion in codfish caught during the food fishery in Newfoundland, which a lot of people depend on for sustenance. So we sampled the, the food web. And we found uh, between two and a half, about two and a half percent ingestion rate, which is really low. So I could publish it in the, you know, Marine Pollution Bulletin, which is where I should publish it, and I should call it uh, ingestion rate of cod slash what's this technical name? Bertha, Bertha, something like that, uh, in Newfoundland waters during cod food fishery season 2014. That's what I should call it. Nope, I'm publishing it somewhere else in a magazine. Said lowest ingestion rate of plastics ever found in the world because it is. Right? That's going to circulate and get around, and you can call me an, an, an intellectual or not, but like, that's, a, that's a thing, that's a thing, that's cinema. Right? Same study, nothing not true about it, same context, written more accessibly, that sort of stuff, but it's going to get around um, in a way that the other stuff isn't. So one of the important things is not to come across as a giant capital I intellectual, right? But like, you know, there's someone who's like pretty smart, actually, it turns out. Oh yes, and PS, I have a PhD. But right, like, so, so there's, different ways, there's different ways to manage that. Yeah. 
But yeah, it totally sucks to be in the United States <laughs> as, a, as an intellectual sometimes, especially if you do like climate change or something. Yeah. So like, let's say like anti-intellectualism then does like drop and then like the overall populace does like back against these things. But at the end of the day, like you said earlier, it has to change on a, like a policy level. And so how do you propose that change when a lot of our policymakers are under the influence of like oil companies and things that want to keep stuff like this for economic reasons? Yeah. Um I do not have awesome reasons for that, which is why I partner with other people who do have awesome answers for that. Um, so what I do know is the reason that the microbead ban went through in the United States kind of without a hitch, guys. And that went out, that's both the chemical and the petroleum and the beauty industries. We're like, okay, right, why did they do that? Because there were cheaper alternatives immediately available, right? and they just have to switch it out and they get enough time. And so they just, it didn't, whatever, it's fine. Great PR. They don't actually have to change like their packaging, which is also PS made of plastics. Um, so, so there's some, some things that pass better than others, don't pass than the others. There's things like um, REACH in the Europe, the Registration Evaluation Assessment of Chemicals. The A may or may not be assessment. Um, but this, it's this idea, it's the precautionary principle. You have to prove that it is safe not that you have to prove that it is harmful, and that is for all chemicals coming into the EU and all products, including water, which is interesting, but any products, right? So if you're a multinational corporation and you sell to the EU, the European Union, as well as the United States, you could have two chemical formulas for your beauty product, or you could have one, right? And so even, even other people's legislations in a global economy are affecting products in the United States and Canada and other places if they're global corporate, you know, so that's very good. Coke, PS kept its formulas different, just so you know. <laughs> but a lot of places that don't have manufacturing spread out everywhere, they'll just do one. And so, so there are you know, other climates. So anti-intellectualism in the States doesn't, ha doesn't have to impact everywhere else. And this because the, the good thing is that this is a global problem. So you can work on it in a bunch of different places and it'll have ripple effects. Yeah. Easy running for you. I promised running. No? Okay. <laughs> so you said if we take a plastic bag to the grocery store, it doesn't really matter. What can we do then? So, I mean, it matters for your personal ethics, which is no small thing. But it, you have not killed a baby dolphin today. Um, so what does matter is, is finding ways to scale up. So voting. I recommend y'all vote. Uh, not for the bad guy. Um, Imagine who that might be, uh, right? So, so voting, right? So you should vote because that scales. Um, doing career work, doing science, that scales. Joining social movements, that scales, right? Even if you work for a community-based organization or an NGO and all you do is lick envelopes, that value added into that organization scales in a way that you as an individual can't, right? That's why I donate to Union of Concerned Scientists because they're the experts on doing that stuff that I would really like to do, but I'm just gonna help them do it, and then I don't have to, and I can just support them. Um, so yeah, you cannot change the world, like, end racism by yourself, impossible. We sort of know that you have to join a social movement to do that. Well, it turns out, systemic oppression of the environment also built like racism. So, you know, we don't try and change racism by our lonesome. So, I mean, in instances, maybe, same with environmentalism, but you, you, know, you, you know you have to scale up, you know you have to have a social movement, you know you have to do it with others and organizations and institutions and policy. So, same deal with, with this kind of problem. Um, earlier, you talked about how uh, the one young scientist uh, was talking about how she wanted to treat plastic is hazardous waste. Do you think like economically that's ever going to be able to be a possibility? Because that's like on such like a large scale to like... No, that was a provocative piece yeah. and Chelsea Rochman knew that. Okay. So there's this really, if you're into discard studies, there's this really great yet incredibly dry book um, by Brian Wynn that I actually, I want to recommend it to you read but it hurts so much so maybe I won't. Uh, but he talks, it's just really dry and it's this big. It has a red cover. Um, and he talks about how in the 90s, 80s or 90s, the, the category of what counted for household waste and hazardous waste was having a problem because there's so much hazardous waste in households. Do you guys know why nail polish only comes in little containers? Because anymore is considered way too toxic, 
right? That's why you never see bulk nail polish, because it will kill you, right? <laughs> so, so what happened was because there was all this hazardous waste in households, right, cleaners, cosmetics, right, that sort of stuff, batteries, they actually had to increase the, category, like the amount of hazardous waste that, or the amounts of toxicity and harm that could happen so that household waste and hazardous waste was different. This is why you can't buy bulk, right? So, so yeah, so moving around, so categories are already political and economic. Um, they already grease the wheels of, of the system that we have. Um, so yeah, they're not gonna be like, oh, you're right, that is true. We should deal with that. We should just switch that up. Um, but the, what's interesting about her proposal is if you, if you recategorize plastics as something dangerous, even mildly dangerous, it actually completely changes the distribution and the cost effectiveness of that. And so actually it would, it would eradicate most disposable plastics. Right, so it's sort of, yeah. And what's cool with, with her and with other scientists is that they don't start radical or political. They're like, oh, well, plastic attracts this much chemical. Oh, well, look, quantitatively, that's that much plastic. Oh, it's actually the norm. According to the TCA, it's this much. Clearly, we need to overthrow capitalism to solve the plastic problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's really cool working with scientists who are actually often more radical than activists that I work with because they've come through this like very step-by-step -step logical sort of and clearly this is where we are. Hazardous waste, let's change our entire economic system, right? While activists had to be like, well, we have all these funders and these stakeholders and they actually think that five small things you can do to save the planet is important, so I guess we should do that. And there's this, well, well they can't actually say that radical thing because now we'll get in trouble. And so actually what I find in plastics, and this isn't necessarily the case in other environmental issues, that the scientists are way more radical than, than almost all of the activist, activist groups, not individual activists, but activist groups that I work with because they're not constrained by the same stakeholder issues for some reason. I don't know who funds Chelsea Rochman. I'm going to ask her. Because um, she can do stuff like that, and she's still on fire. She's doing really well. Baby legs. Baby legs? Just a little bit more baby legs. All right. So uh, the gentleman in the orange would like to hear more about baby legs. So uh, I also have other technologies like ped rock, et cetera. But baby legs is the star of my show. Uh, because her name is Baby Lakes. So the way that you would normally sample marine plastics in the water is you would get a surface trawl. Uh, they're called manta, ray, or manta trawls. They're like this big, they're made of metal. They have a big plankton net on the back of them. They cost $3,500 and so are prohibitively expensive to the average person, including myself actually, and I have a lab and funding um, because we lost one and we actually can't replace it uh, because Newfoundland weather is ridiculous. So, so what Baby Legs is, is a $5 version of that, and we validated her, and she does collect the same quality of information as the $3,500 Manta Troll. She's a soda pop bottle, well, square, because doing math on a circle is awful, so we made her square. And then she's a pair of baby pantyhose that's stuck on with a pl plumber's clamp and like a rope on the front. You just drag her behind her little legs <laughs> in the boat. It's awesome. And, and um, she collects the same quality of data, five knots or less, which is about what we do a manta trawl on, on medium chop, which is about what we do the manta trawl on. And it means that you can proliferate an entire network of citizen science gathering data from all over Newfoundland and Labrador, which is where I work. Huge coastline, kind of it's one of the largest coastlines in the world. And I just can't afford to give everyone $3,500 manta trawls. The other thing is, and this is, do you want me to talk about the IP? Okay. So the horrible truth that you will all learn as you move through is that if you invent something at a university, the university owns your intellectual property, almost exclusively anywhere in the developed world. If you invent something, a university can patent it and they own it. You got, you'll probably get royalties, your name will stay on it, but it is not yours. So baby legs, I really wanted baby legs to be open source and you can't do that if she's patented. So what I did is I leveraged sexism to defer capitalism. <laughs> so, when I, so as a rule, it's in my collective agreement, we have a union where I am, uh, the collective agreement says I, within 30 days of me inventing something, I have to tell my department head and she has to put it up to the office of research what I've invented. And so I got baby links, these pink tights, little hearts on them, and I gave her a little belt that was pink and put little googly eyes on her and I crossed her legs and set her at the edge of a sink and I took the photo and sent that up to engineering. And engineering was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> We don't care, this is not technology. Excellent. 
So now what I do is I make really, really ugly or really, really cute technology that engineering, because the Office of Research is run by traditionally trained male engineers, don't take seriously so that I keep my patents and then I release them as open source. And that is, as far as I can tell, the only way to keep the rights to my inventions for doing citizen science for marine plastic research. So y'all can make baby legs. <laughs> Actually, it brings me to this, my next point, my final point, maybe, possibly. Which way are we going? We're going this way. Yeah. So, these are two of my students. I have an opening for a master's student. If you're a senior, we pay our master's students in Canada. How weird. Um, $17,000 a year for two years. Canadian dollars, but you'll be spending Canadian dollars. Um, to work with me and Clear, making these sorts of technologies. We're specifically looking for people trained in the social sciences who are familiar with science, so interdisciplinarians, like the people who come out of liberal arts colleges. Um, so you can do science with us, but ask social and cultural questions of that science. That's what we're looking for. The deadline is imminent. It's a rolling deadline, so we'll take the first best thing that comes. Uh, so if you're interested, this is on the Discard Studies blog. Um, you can look at it, tell your friends, unless you're applying, because then that's more competition. <laughs> no, you should do that, you should share. Um, so we're looking for that to sort of, yeah, expand, um, expand our program. Clear has 12 students working for it right now. We're looking for lucky number, lucky number 13. So. Should we take one last question and then wrap up? If anyone doesn't want the last word. It's mine. Last word. <laughs> I've already talked a lot. Well, thank you very much. Oh, oh. she has one. She has one. And she's, I was going to volunteer. And she's a really good audience member. I've been watching you the whole time. And you're like nodding. I'm like, oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm watching you. I have no poker face. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to throw this in a completely different direction. Could you go back to your um, Venn diagram? picture on our right. Yep. Roman aqueduct? Uh, it's Brooklyn sewage. Brooklyn. Ah. Ah. So there goes my question. <laughs> I was going to talk about the role of time in this, in the, in this oh, issue of... Oh, about the role of time in this issue. We don't have to, we don't need a Venn diagram for that. Oh. oh, so that was the question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. The role of time in, in, in thinking about cultural shifts in, in approaching science and technology. Right, so here's the good news. Um, no matter what we do, plastic is gonna outlast our species, not because we're doomed to failure as a species, but because it lasts in geological time, and geological time lasts longer than species, um, even if you're dinosaurs, which was the longest. Um, so even if we don't do anything, the plastic problem will come to an end, <laughs> because the plastic problem is gonna last a gazillion years. Not a gazillion, but like hundreds of thousands. Um, so, so time is actually really important though, because it means that if you've got a research object that is going to outlast any research program you can put together, um, you, just, you just end up with long-term sort of things. My secret dream is that the NSF starts funding intergenerational research programs, right? Most research programs are three, five, 10 years. The things we need to know, especially for say low-dose studies and endocrinologists, those actually, um, because they, so here's a, here's a really freaky thing about BPA. If you're a woman and you're pregnant with a woman or a girl, a baby fetus, that is a girl, um, and you're exposed to an endocrine disruptor, that can affect the little girl's eggs. And that, right, and that's the point of exposure. It might not manifest for three generations, which means we need at least three generations worth, uh, like a research study that can, that can handle three, at the very least, right? Um, so it changes, it just, that totally mixes up what a research program looks like, right? And actually feminist science research is starting to be like, hey guys, what about intergenerational kinship-based sort of science studies, right? What would that look like? Um, the other thing is that it really complicates quick and easy solutions like cleanups because all you're doing is defer, you're just pushing, you're just moving around, shuffling around plastics. So if you put it in the landfill, this is like recycling and cleanups and stuff. So if you do a beach cleanup of marine plastics and move it into a landfill, well in 1,000, 10,000, climate change, 1,000 years, that landfill's gonna be underwater and now you've got ocean plastics again. Or it's gonna erode and it's gonna go downhill back. So, right, so, so that totally changes the frame because of these massive time scales. It totally changes the frame of what makes sense or not in a way that's 
uh, terrifying, pleasurable, and you know, also it's, it's very mix up -able. Um, things like remediation, things, and I mean, nuclear waste folks have been on this forever. It's just that technically nuclear waste and plastics are very, very similar in, you know, although one's very mundane and sort of everywhere. They've sort of been on this forever. Um, and they're already talking about how do you communicate with, you know, aliens and people 10,000 years in the future when English will be different and what do we do? You should ask them the same questions about plastics, actually. Um, so, um, those are some of the new cultural sort of questions that have busted into science because of the longevity issue. It's a good question. I just wrote a paper about it, got published three days ago. <laughs> we can hear you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.